I have seriously studied the Bible uh, for 40 years now. And the more I study, the more I realize that there's more to study. And I've been through all types of Bible studies, have read many books and read many articles, but probably the one Bible study that has affected my life as far as the change on a regular basis that I've done is the Experience in God study. Many of you have done this, and you know what I'm talking about. If you're not familiar with this, it's an older one. It came out in the 90s, but really even to today, it's just as fresh as it ever was. Henry Blackaby basically looked at the scriptures and saw a pattern. And that pattern was realities, seven realities that he saw through the scriptures. And these realities are a way of helping us think through what we're studying the scriptures, but then also how are we seeing God work around us. The realities go like this. Number one, God is always at work around us. It's not that we ask God to come with us. God is already doing the work. Second reality, God is, is looking for searching for a continuing love relationship with us that's real and personal. The third one, God invites us to get involved with Him in His work. The fourth reality is that God speaks through the Holy Spirit by using the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal Himself, His purposes, and His ways. The fifth reality is that God's invitation for you and I to join Him always leads to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. The sixth reality is, when we're willing to go with God and willing to step out in faith, then we're going to be challenged. And that challenge is something that at times it, it could be a personal challenge. Sometimes our families are challenged by that. But God's call to us is an opportunity for us to put our faith and trust in Him and just follow Him. And then that seventh reality is, as we obey the Father, we find ourselves stepping into His work and we come to know God by experience. This past Sunday morning we had uh, the Bible study was on Elisha and the contest on Mount Carmel with the 450 prophets of Baal. And very familiar outline of the emphasis there on Elijah and his, and his power, his prayer power, and his trust in God. And something that stood out to me once again as I studied that with our Sunday school class was that Elijah was in the right place. There was an altar there. Elijah did the right thing. He rebuilt the altar of God. He did it at the right time. The sacrifice was at the evening sacrifice. And then he was totally dependent on God to come through and answer with fire. It also then reminded me of another person in scriptures who didn't do that. Uh, his name was King Saul. King Saul was the first king over Israel. And yet he was a major disappointment uh, because... He started off with such promise, but then he had some fatal flaws. And they're the same kind of flaws that you and I face at times. And that flaw was pride, arrogance, self-deception. Self-deception basically means he basically didn't, didn't know himself. He didn't, he didn't understand the things he was doing was being self-destructive. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, this is the time when God finally just says, that's it, I am rejecting Saul as king. Now what, what took place? He was informed by Samuel, the prophet, that he was to go to the Amalekites and completely destroy the Amalekites. The Amalekites were, well to put it another way, they were the ISIS of their day. What ISIS is in our day as far as the destructive just total devastation that they would bring to places. That's what the Amalekites were. And God was going to use Israel as His arm of judgment to completely wipe them out. And He was given very clear instructions that He was to go and to spare nothing. Everything was to be destroyed. But He didn't listen. 
his ear was more toward the people than it was actually toward God and toward his prophet Samuel. What we learn from this is how easily we can get tricked into thinking that what we're doing is what God wants us to do when in actual practice we're doing the exact opposite. We're being totally disobedient. He spared Agag, the king. He spared some of the best sheep and goats and animals. And yet the whole time he's telling Samuel, listen, I did exactly what God told me to do. No, he didn't. Samuel then gives as good a description of what obedience and worship must be as you'll find anywhere in Scripture. In fact, Jesus himself quotes this as he's talking to the Pharisees. This is in 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Now that is highly important for you and I to remember even to this day. Now I know we don't do the sacrificial system. We don't bring the animals. And yet, God is teaching us something there. He's teaching us a reality of what it means really to worship Him. You see, I can give without loving, but I can't love without giving. Worship must be separated sometimes from the expressions of worship. Let me explain. The expressions of worship themselves would be like attending a worship time, giving, praising, singing, praying, reading the scriptures, even responding to God. But there is something that needs to be separate from the expressions of worship, and it's basically this. Worship means obedience. Think of it this way. Every time you are obedient to the Lord, you are worshiping the Lord. Every time you know what you need to do next and you do it, that's a worship experience. That can happen on a Sunday morning. That can happen on a Wednesday afternoon. When you know that you are doing what the Lord is wanting you to do, that is an act of worship. So, to use the illustration, I can give without loving, but I can't love without giving. I could be doing the actions of worship and yet being self-deceived not have an obedience in worship. Obedience, listening to the Father, is what God is looking when it comes to actually worshiping Him. Saul's character flaw is something that if we're honest, we can see it in ourselves. We have the tendency to hide the truth from ourselves. We have the tendency to think at times we're doing better maybe than we actually are. What do you do in moments like that? Well, I want to encourage you, have at least one person in your life that you know loves you completely and then give them the complete ability to be honest with you because sometimes people can see things in us that we can't see in ourselves. Mine is my wife. Debbie has complete openness to be able to see if I'm not quite where I need to be. And that is invaluable because we all have a tendency to deceive ourselves at times. God was going to use Saul as his arm of judgment. And Saul partially did what God told him to do. Blackaby pointed this out in his study. Partial obedience is actually disobedience. If you just do part of what God says without doing all of what God says, you're not being just a little bit obedient. You're being disobedient. The human heart has almost an infinite capacity to deceive itself and to trick us into thinking that we are really doing better than we actually are. Now, how does self-deception work? How does, how, does it, how does it happen that we can get so caught up into what we think we're doing as well when we're not really doing that well? 
Well, for one thing is, the minute that Samuel confronted him, he got defensive. Immediately. He, he, he immediately spoke and said, wait a minute, I did everything that you told me to do. Then when Samuel began to push him, he started shifting the blame. He said, well, the people, they're the ones who took the best of all the animals, but we brought them for a good reason, to sacrifice to God. God didn't ask for that. This wasn't the first time that Saul had done that. It was something that was now becoming a pattern in his life. It was a pattern that God saw and a pattern that God said it can't stand. Last week I talked some about Jesus starting His church and how we need to be connected to His church. We need to be connected to His church because Jesus loves the church and gave Himself for it. But there's another reason. When you're around God's people, that is a hedge against self-deception. When you're out by yourself and there's no one calling you on things, it's very easy to get caught up in doing what you think is right. But something about being around God's people it keeps us close to what worship really is. That's what the gospel does. The gospel is our way out of self-deception. Jesus became small. He was great, but he became small so that he can help us to see that God is going to do something great in us. Now think about this. What are you going to be doing a million years from today? <laughs> what are you going to be doing? Jesus says you're going to be ruling and reigning with Him. What happens on this earth is unbelievably small compared to what's going to be happening forever in heaven. What God wants us to understand is He sees where we're headed. He needs us to know where we're headed as well. Let that truth sink into your heart. And don't allow the small things around you to cause you to deceive yourself into thinking that you're doing what you need to be doing. Jesus quoted the same verse, Does God want sacrifice or does God want obedience? He wants obedience. Part of that study of experiencing God was a way of helping us realize this is how to recognize God's voice. This is how to recognize God's activity. This is how to respond properly when you're in the presence of God. I want to encourage you once again, get involved with God's people. Get involved in a Sunday school class. Get involved in worship. I know it's easy to stay home and to watch worship. What is worship though? Worship is obedience to what God is saying to us. Let's make sure that we're being obedient the way God sees obedience and not just the way that we think we're being obedient. It's so easy to deceive ourselves. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you teach us that worship is all about obedience. And you know our hearts. You know how easily it is for us to deceive ourselves. So Father, as we think through what Saul did, and then we think through what Elijah did, help us to be in the right place at the right time, doing the proper things, the things that bring you honor and glory, simple obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.